Arcade Castle here with another unboxing video, which serves two purposes. One, to get this stuff out of the box and onto the shelf because it's been in this box for a couple of months, and also to test the onboard audio and video for this new camera. It's a JVC Inverio that I got from a redneck at a flea market for $25. I did check it. <laughs> I did turn it on and make sure it worked before I bought it. So without further ado, let's get into this big old box of Japan video game themed board game goodness. As always, we have our requisite Japanese newspaper. So without a further ado, let's go take a look at it. And now, onto the games. Let's start with this one first, the smallest one out of all of them, and I, for the life of me, cannot remember what it is, because I got these back in the late spring on Japamart, or Yahoo Japan, and then they sat for about a month, and then they got shipped to me, and then they sat around for a few more months. So, without further ado, let's see what it is. And once I started opening these up, I realized what they were. They are a deck of playing cards from Nintendo. And what I like about them, I've actually had my eye on them for a while. They are essentially just playing cards for the Virtual Boy as sort of a promotional item that they made back when the Virtual Boy came out. As you can see, it is the Mario Tennis for the Virtual Boy. And these were released probably right around 94, 95 as a promotional item. However, stateside, these cards can generally go for anywhere from $75 to $100. However, if you're getting them from Yahoo Japan, I believe I got these for maybe $10 or so. And... Now the second game I'm unboxing today is this one right here, and I do know what this one is. And it is a interesting piece of technology that mirrors some of the games that came out around the same time in the United States. And it is this game! Because as you remember I bought these like six months ago, and I don't remember what this name translates to. So hopefully John in editing can figure it out based on his past Yahoo Japan purchases. And it is part of a uh, subgenre in the Party Joy series. This one specifically based on games that utilized cassettes as a integral part of the gameplay. And if a cassette based game seems kind of familiar, you are not too far off. That is because in 1988, Golden released Shrieks and Creeks in the United States and relied heavily upon a talking cassette that you hooked into a speaker in order to proceed throughout the game and ultimately win it by escaping the mansion. However, for the girls of the time, since you couldn't have a game that catered both to boys and girls simultaneously, you had Girl Talk Dateline, which also came out around 1988-1989 and also utilized a cassette and was also published by Golden. However, this game came out in 1985 and was the fifth in the series. And so you can kind of see how the concept of cassettes in board games was not necessarily a new thing by the time these other two games came out. So I am here assuming that the shrink wrap was applied on there by the seller and it's not new and shrink. Regardless, I'm gonna open it because games are meant to be open and games are meant to be played. If Toy Story 2 didn't teach me anything else, taught me that. I'm gonna lean to say that this game has been played, so let's get the components out and take a quick look at them to see what this game comes with. And here is what the game comes with. Now, first and foremost, what I think is kind of interesting is not only did the previous owner be kind and rewind, but also it still has the original stopper in here for the cassette tape. Now, both sides of the tape, the label on it is exactly the same, but 
as you will see here and on the game in general, there is uh, some levels of cultural insensitivity, to say nothing else. But that aside, the components you get are your four pawn players, a D6, four treasure maps, there's a stack of terrain tiles, a bridge, and also you have your item cards and presumably the treasure that you were trying to get in order to win the game. Now, if I had to guess what the role of the cassette is for, if you look at the back of the interior slide where all the components are kept, my assumption is that the cassette is kind of dictating perhaps disasters that occur on the game that befall players, not unlike Shrieks and Creeks or even some of the later VHS games like Nightmare, but it probably also dictates when these trail tiles get laid down because they will dictate how the board is laid out over time and may change how the player proceeds throughout the course of the game. And again, this is kind of similar to Nightmare 3, if I recall, or maybe Nightmare 4, the VHS game, to where the board was slightly modular and that you could move stuff around in order to prevent your opponents from winning the game. Now, if I had to guess, just based on the components, what you, the player, are doing is exploring the map and trying to uncover all of the locations on your treasure card in accordance with grids on the map. And when you do that, you're trying to uncover the location of the hidden treasure. And as you are proceeding throughout the course of the game, you are utilizing items, collecting items, overcoming hazards, laying new trails, and essentially dealing with whatever the cassette is meeting out to you whenever you are taking your turn. Because that is generally how these cassettes work, simply because the cassette doesn't know who is playing and when it is simply a cassette that is running. So it kind of depends on who's playing, when the cassette bestows something upon the player or creates a hazard or something that the player must overcome. Now one thing I think is kind of interesting about this particular Party Joy game is that the interior sleeve that the game components come in is composed of cardboard. And that is simply because with most of the Party Joy games, let's take the classic Party Joy Number 51, which is the Super Mario Brothers Party Joy game from Bandai, also released in 1985, it comes in a plastic sleeve. Now, the main line of Party Joy games, and even some of the other ones, come with plastic sleeves, and these actually serve pretty well to hold all the components in, as well as a locking sleeve so that when you slide the box on, you kind of essentially have the game locked into the box, and barring any horrible warping or dishing of the box or the box sleeve, you can carry these around pretty well without having to worry about them falling apart. And that's sort of at odds with what you would see with most US games where the lid lifts off versus sliding off. But different strokes for different folks. But if you do know, they are actually the same dimensions with the exception of height. The Party Joy cassette game is about twice as thick as the regular Party Joy game line. And so if I had to guess, the reason why they use cardboard and not plastic is to reduce costs because the plastic in this game is going towards the cassette, which probably raised the price per unit on this game versus the general Party Joy line. So now let us take a look at our next game. Now in this bundle there are two games, however we're going to be looking at the top one of the stack simply because it's smaller and if we're going from small to large, that's just the way I've decided to do it in this video. We're going to be looking at this one next and I'm sure most of you have a generally good idea of what this game features. And that is this LSI RPG SD Gundam board game video game hybrid from 1990 released by Bandai. Now. The SD Gundam series is more than just video games, and so it's always kind of hard for me to tell whenever I see an SD Gundam board game whether or not it is necessarily based off of one of the SD Gundam video games that were released in Japan throughout the 90s and even the late 80s, and continue on even to now. But the reason I picked this one up is simply because of this component right here and that is because it is essentially a tiger handheld what more do you need for your heavy rpg euro than an lcd tiger handheld to determine your fate 
So let us take a look at this game and see what it comes with beyond the... <laughs> the... Oh man, that. It's a barcode battler. That's what this is. Okay. So barcode battlers, think of them as like e-readers before e-readers were over here. They also have some of that with um, the newer Pokemon games with the barcodes or the uh, sort of like UPCs on the side. And essentially, okay, those are stuck together. But anyway, this is not, well, it is an LCD game, but it's also a barcode battler for where you would take a card and slide it through and then it would read it and whatever powers that this card has or the character would appear on the screen and then you could use them in order to conduct battles. Please don't have batteries, please don't have batteries, please don't have batteries. Oh, oh man. If I can get it open. What? Oh. It lifts straight off. Well, it has batteries in it, so let's see if it works. Oh my god. Up. Oh. We'll work on you later. Turning my attention to the board, it actually kind of reminds me of a lot of Bandai Party Joy games. Here, let me show you. So, so if we take Party Joy 51, the Super Mario Brothers again, and essentially empty out, uh, let's, let's jump out of the way. So as you're playing the Super Mario Brothers Party Joy game, whenever you're on one of the le levels, so level four, for example, you take all the level four cards, you have the starting card, and as you're proceeding throughout the level by going to the different spaces, you are procedurally generating the level by placing new tiles, or in this case, a hidden area that would go below the board. And it's actually pretty similar here in that you have map A, map B, and map C. Map D just has places to place the cards. And essentially, as you can see here, you are probably starting somewhere, let's just say here. Yeah, start. Ha. You have ends, battles, cards, and different locations you can stop at on your turn in order to probably get new barcode cards out of this deck, which are either characters or weapons that can help you in this barcode battler. And then essentially your goal is to proceed to the goal. And win the game. So that is the SD Gundam game. A, I actually didn't expect it to be a barcode battler. The pictures didn't really give me a good degree of detail. They essentially showed the box. And so the only picture I had was this. And so it is actually, I would lean to say, pretty language independent because most of the cards, well, I mean, you do have the instructions, but most of the cards are essentially you know, your basic cards. And that since you're playing an LCD game here, that is more language independent because they're not going to be able to fit too much stuff on a little LCD game from 1990. Because it's probably along the same lines of a Tiger handheld, although I think that's an injustice to a barcode battler to call it or even compare it to that. But I do think that this will actually be a really interesting game to play. I've always been interested in getting a barcode battler because there were a number of games that were released for the barcode battler in Japan. You have the Super Mario Brothers barcode battler, and you also had The Legend of Zelda, which were released in the late 80s, when the barcode battlers kind of caught on. And now onto the fourth item from the unboxing. I already know what this is, and it's actually had a reprint in the last few years. However, 
Those reprints, for whatever reason, have gone up in price, and so when I saw this one for fairly cheap, I decided to pick it up. Now, looking at the board, which is where I'm gleaning a lot of my interpretation of this game from, you are preceding the slimes around the track by playing movement cards, and I would assume this is where you are betting the money in the game in order to get either more money or translate the money to victory points at the end of the game. Now, obviously, I would lean to assume that there are several payouts throughout the course of the game that you are predicting a slime's certain position at a certain mile marker whenever that comes up, or the ultimate goal at the end of the game. Now, when I first looked at this game, I didn't think it was that complex, simply because as I was looking through the cards, it's, oh, okay, you're just moving slimes, X amount of spots, and whatever happens, happens. However, I realized that you're going to have a hand of cards that move different slimes a number of spaces. And so that's where the strategy comes in. Depending on who you're betting on, which I assume would be secretive, that you are trying not to let other players know who you're betting on to try and get the highest payout or the most points. And so you have these cards, which I'm assuming, again, no one can see, and that throughout the course of the game, you're gonna have a random hand of cards that may help you and may not help you with the strategy you are trying to do throughout the course of the game. And so I think this game could, if you have a full contingent of players, be a fun and very strategic racing game with fairly simple gameplay that is largely language independent once you get the basic rules out. And also you have English on the cards too with <laughs> diagrams on how to use them. So again, a fairly language independent game that is fairly accessible to pretty much all gamers that has at least a certain modicum of strategy into it. And the reason I bought this game also, in addition to it being fairly cheap, is that it has a lot of character. If you look at the cards, you can see that these cards have been shuffled and played with a whole lot. In addition to that, one of the pawns got lost at some point and some kid decided to make their own slime to play in the game. And so I feel like this, this board game has a history to it, a provenance, if you will, and it has a lot of character. And for me, that matters a lot with a board game because I don't know, it just does. Don't judge me. Now the piece de resistance. Oh man, I can't wait to get this bad boy open and take a look at the artwork. Look at that. Oh man, I can't wait. And that is the Makai Mura game, also known as, AKA, Ghosts and Goblins, released by Bandai in 1986. And this game I've actually been looking for for quite a while, but it is relatively hard to find, let alone finding it in a complete state, and also in good condition, and also for an affordable price. But luckily, the stars aligned and I was able to acquire this copy. So let's open it up and see the amazing contents inside. And this is the amazingly detailed and beautiful board for the Ghost and Goblins board game released by Bandai in 1986. And the board may look pretty big. In fact, I kind of have to back up a little bit to get it all on camera. And that is because Bandai utilized every square inch of their board game boxes. Now this is actually a pretty standard size board game for the board game size that they made at that time. And where this one is a bit different from most US board games is whereas US board games typically have it cut down the middle or maybe chop it in the forks and you fold it up, what they did is they actually created a double crease here to imitate the side of the box. So whenever you put the board back into the box, you actually would be storing it essentially like this, to where not only are you getting additional stability inside the box with this additional wall, you're getting more board for your buck, essentially. So without further ado, I'm just gonna enjoy this board for a minute.
in addition to this beautiful board, you have the final level to where you must ascend this cardboard, I mean stone staircase, riddled the skeletons of those who failed in order to win the game. So beyond the amazing board game and box art of the Ghost and Goblins board game, you are at least getting something that's a little more than your simple roll and move to where you start at a given point, proceed along a trail, and then get to your given end point in order to win the game. Because the game, because it's Ghost and Goblins theme, has to operate at least to a certain degree by the rules that the video game dictates, in that you have procedural levels of worlds that match the video game, as well as enemies that are in the game, and the ultimate goal, which is to rescue Prin Prin from the evil demon king Astaroth. And so, in the Ghosts and Goblins board game, you get four Arthur minifigs, and a rather chunky d6. In addition to that, you have a large deck of double-sided cards that feature Arthur both in his armored and unarmored state. You have a deck of enemy cards. Oh, my old enemy. Decayed rubber bands. But you have a bestiary with various enemies you will encounter throughout the course of the game. And you also have the items that will help you on your journey, including the cross, Sword, fire, and axe. And all of this will help you get... Treasures, which you'll be picking up throughout the course of the game as well. And I really like this little plastic case that the treasure cards came in because it reminds me of the plastic cases that the various rummy and gin card games came in throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And especially like stuff like this, which were at local zoos, aquariums, and museums, you were learning stuff in addition to getting a game to boot. So in addition to all the stuff that you can get to help you on your quest to defeat the enemies, you also have to face the mini-bosses that occur throughout the course of the game as well. And they have their own cards as well that you have to work your way through in sort of a miniature event deck of sorts. And as you're playing the game, you are proceeding as Arthur, collecting items and treasure to defeat the enemies, and the bosses as you proceed your way through the Ghost and Goblins world in order to rescue Prin Prin, aka Guinevere, and win the game.